<laughs> Hello, everybody. I am so glad to be here right now. My name is Amy. I'm the Vice President of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we're doing this. All right. Well, my friends will agree that I often say what a joy it is that we share this planet with wildlife. It's, it just makes life worth living to me and maybe to you too. Unfortunately, um, wildlife is facing a lot of challenges these days from climate change to poaching to illegal wildlife trade and to deforestation. And one of the victims of this is the beautiful, the mythical, the elegant jaguar. Today, we're going to be gathering together. We're going to be learning about the jaguar. We're going to be meeting one of my heroes and who's saving jaguars. We're going to learn how we can help to, and we're going to have a drink. That's what we're going to do. You are watching Cocktails and Conservation. Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet, hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. All right, I'm Amy Gottliff, Vice President of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with wildlife heroes from around the globe. We're gonna listen to their stories. We're just gonna like be in a jungle bar with them, listen to their stories, hear what they're doing, and hear how we can help, like people like you and me can take action for wildlife. Um, again, I'm your host, Amy. I'm the conservation director at Oakland Zoo. Um, you know, normally people come to the zoo, they're seeing the lion, they're seeing the tiger and our beautiful jaguar, and we're able to talk to them one-on-one -on -one about what is happening with these animals and how they can help. We're also able to have our impact speaker series where you can all gather in big groups, remember that, and learn from these great speakers. Well, we can't do any of that. So cocktails and conservation is our pivot. This is our way of gathering all of our friends and community together, all the people who love animals like we do, meeting a hero right here and learning from them and figuring out how we can, how we can help and empowering you um, to, to help too and actually have a really good time together. So if you're listening and you're hearing that, um, maybe just type roar in the comments. This is supposed to be interactive. Hello. All right. Good to see everybody. Okay, we want to welcome everybody. Um, we have friends here gathering. It's so wonderful to see. Um, we have Oakland Zoo donors. So I really want to say a special thank you to those Oakland Zoo donors, friends of the wild, um, people who really help us do what we do at the zoo. We couldn't do it without you. Um, also here are friends of Kami Nando. They have a fantastic um, group of community themselves and we're hoping to build. Um, we have cat people. Um, if you see a couple cats walking behind me, I'm a cat person. Um, we have fans of Baja Taqueria. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Baja Taqueria and we're going to learn all about them. Um, in fact, if you're a fan of Baja Taqueria or not, now would be a good time to think about your Baja Red Sangria drink that was made especially for Caminando. Um, our producer, Adrian, is going to pop that recipe into the comments right now. And in case you haven't started chopping and dicing and squeezing and mixing, you can do that right now. Um, I did that this morning. All right. Um, we really hope you're doing okay. These are weird times. They're rough times. I don't get it. There's so much going on. I'm just so glad to gather together at this time with like-minded people, take a drink, relax, and, and learn away from everything else. All right. Um, Here's a question of the day. What do you love about Jaguars? So maybe in the comments, you can write what you love. I'm gonna be asking our guests, 
which she loves, and I bet we're on the same team here. All right, today's guest. Today's guest, I will admit, is a very good friend of mine, Dr. Kimberly Craighead. She is the co-founder and director of the Kami Nando Jaguar Project in Panama. Um, Kim, I've known for decades. Um, she is a just a lover of wildlife. Wherever she is, wherever we walk, she knows every bird, every little thing we see. She's got a reason for why it does this or that huge, just wholehearted love of every creature. She has been wanting to um, find her niche in wildlife in cats forever. And she's explored the globe, helping all kinds of different cats before she got to the Jaguar. And when she did, she didn't just join an organization. This person and her partner started an organization. They started from scratch and created solutions. And she just blows my mind. Her PhD is in Jaguar and Puma Habitat Use Analysis. What is that? We'll find out. And it's never been done for Jaguars before. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kimberly Craighead. Hi, Hello. Amy. <laughs> Hi, good to see you. Hello. <laughs> Um, thank you for joining us. We are so glad you're here. Me too. Likewise. Um, so I love your beautiful apartment. Where are you? And how are you doing during COVID? I have been trapped in my Oakland jungle <laughs> apartment. <laughs> um, you can see, you know, I have my own Jaguar behind me. He's been keeping me company. Um, you know, my jungle plants here. So yeah, it's been, it's been a very strange time being trapped here and not being able to escape to my real jungle of Panama. Yeah. So you absolutely can't go there right now. Absolutely cannot. The airport in Panama has been closed for international travel. Um, and it's still closed through July, basically. Um, I'm so sorry about that. That must be maddening. Um, and normally you're there. How often are you there normally? Well, we're there more and more uh, as years go by. It's been a few years now. So we're increasing our time there um, until COVID hit. It's about half the year we've been spending down there. Got it. Not all, um, and what not all Yeah. What are you doing to stay sane during COVID? What's your secret thing you love to do? Or what have you been watching that maybe we should all watch or maybe you don't want to tell us? Tell us. Yeah, well, some embarrassing things that I've been watching. But uh, yeah. I, I um, unlike most people, I, I don't have Netflix. And I just had a one-month trial of Netflix. So I, I did a lot of French films, um, some really stupid comedy that I'm embarrassed about. And uh, <laughs> I did also succumb to the lion or the, the uh, tiger king. Oh, good God. Okay. Well, me too. Me too. Um, before I go on, I just want to um, say, hey, do you have your sangria? I do. Okay, good. It. We'll pull that out soon. And I want to kind of out you on something funny. Um, I know you've got a pet peeve around the way people say, Jaguar. So I want everyone who's listening to say the name Jaguar, which seems simple enough. Everyone try to say it somewhere, wherever you are. Jaguar. All right. How do you say it? You did it correctly. What? However, you didn't. Often I hear people say Jaguar. <laughs> Jaguar is just not the word at all. Got it. So thank you for pronouncing it correctly. It is Jaguar. <laughs> okay. Not Jaguar. Okay. You're trying to Correct. prevent Jaguars, actually. Got it. <laughs> yes. All right. So I want to do a quick announcement and say for all those Oakland Zoo community members who are listening or who may watch this, we want to thank you for all your support. We've gotten such love and support for the Oakland Zoo in the past week. Um, we couldn't be more thankful to be in this community of fantastic people. 
And I want to let you know that one of the missions of the Oakland Zoo is not only to stay running and to give our animals the best care possible and create education programs, but to help organizations like Kim's succeed. We really want um, our reach, our funds, our love, our support, our skills, and our resources to go into the fields to help wild animals. We pick partners that we feel are doing the most inspirational work and we do everything we can for them. So this moment right now, this hour is for Kaminando. All the love and support and concern, we're just gonna pour right into this project for this time we are together. All right, so one thing I've noticed, Dr. Kim, um, after years of doing conservation is deforestation seems to be a major issue. And it really seems to be a major issue with the jaguar in your project. Um, they're also facing poaching, illegal wildlife trade, human wildlife conflict with local people. Like what kind of person are you that you decide to just take this on? Like how did you come to love animals? What was the first sign when you grew up that this was it for you? Well, hmm. I think my mother said I was born this way, so um, I don't. I don't really think I've been any different. So, I also believe it's probably genetic. Um, on the Craighead side of the family, there are two brothers, Frank and John, who were very renowned and still are for their work in in wildlife biology. They actually pioneered the GPS uh, collars and they put them on grizzly bears in, in Yellowstone. So I just think it runs in the family. I'm a big carnivore lover, as were they, and um, I've really opted for the, the cat route. <laughs> so um, growing up on Cape Cod, you know, I ran around freely exploring, and we didn't have the big cats that I love so much, but uh, I had to, you know, had to deal with just the birds and the marine mammals. Got it. So I have a photo of you, some of your first in your career, maybe. What's going on here? Mm, well, I do love that picture. That's a great shot. Um, that was my first experience with field work, and it just really changed my life, that trip. Uh, this is on Cape Cod during high school. I was with my ecology teacher, and it was the first time I'd ever been in the field spending the night at a, uh, you know, at a field house. And we were studying uh, white-tailed deer for a Lyme disease project, mm -hmm. and we were tracking them with radio telemetry, and that's what you can see there, um, some equipment. And it was... Uh, it was really life-changing experience. My ecology teacher was the best. <laughs> it doesn't matter, man. All right, yeah. so my next question, Kim, as someone who knows you, you have been exploring different cats, trying to figure out what is the cat of your heart for a while. Like, where did you start in your cat journey and how did you land on jaguars? <laughs> my cat journey began actually with tigers in the Sunderbunds. I really wanted to study man-eating tigers um, until I actually went there. Um, I spent some time with the Sunderbunds Tiger Project and it was a really, really difficult place to work. Um, and then I decided, well, I've got, I've got pumas in my backyard in California, so I should just, I should probably take advantage of that. And so that's what I did. Um, and then for my, this was for my, my dissertation, my PhD research. Mm -hmm. So I selected the puma and I wanted to do um, some habitat use studies and I wanted to collect scat using scat detection dogs. And so during the course of my dissertation, I did an internship in Brazil with a Jaguar project and they were using scat detection dogs. And so I thought, what a great place to go learn how to use this method. And so off I went to Brazil um, to work on this Jaguar project and learn about scat dogs. And while I was in Brazil, I went to see Jaguars in the Pantanal. Um, 
that was also a very life-changing experience. When I saw my first Jaguar, it brought me to tears. And wow. I was just awesome. And so, um, you know, yeah, so, you know, I ended up buying land in Panama with my partner. And so I decided, well, why not study Jaguars in Panama on our land? And uh, there's also Pumas as well. So I sort of had all my cats in one basket, you know, but that's how Jaguars came to be in my world. Got it. All right. That's a journey. So you know what you're doing now. So yeah. here's this epic Jaguar. And I'm reading what other people love about the Jaguar. And people really have awesome things to say. Um, I love their colors. I love their powerful jaw length, um, their musculature. Um, they're sleek and fast. They're elegant. I love their rosettes. She knew about rosettes, Joyce Hicks. Um, what do you love about them? Uh, well, they're very, they're sort of like the underdog of cats. You know, people haven't really given them a lot of attention up until lately. And uh, they have a really magical, mythical history with humans and indigenous people throughout Central America, Latin America. Um, you know, they're revered as, as, a, as a god, as a spirit, really important to indigenous people and cultures. Um, they're, they're very elusive. I mean, they really are for a cat. They're, they're probably the hardest to see in the, in the jungles. Um, not in the Pantanal as, as some of you may know now, but in the rest of their range, they're pretty tough to see. Got it. Um, many reasons. <laughs> Got it. And so now that you've come to love this beautiful animal, um, what are some of the challenges they're facing? So I have this image of what looks like was a full forest and now is not. What is happening there? Right. Well, that's a classic uh, image of deforestation. So, um, you know, they call it the, in, in Panama, they call it the agricultural frontier. So people really they buy the land, they move on the land, and the first thing they do is cut the trees down. And um, they do that for livestock, raising, and agricultural purposes. And so humans just continue to encroach into the, the natural world and into the forest where these animals live. Um, it's really the number one issue for, for most species today, terrestrial species and large, large predators. Yikes, so that seems like, so what is it doing to the pathway of the jaguar? Like what is hap what's the result? Uh, the result of deforestation, you know, clearly it's less habitat for the animals to roam. So for a, a large wide ranging species like the jaguar, uh, you need connectivity. And so often the deforestation leads to fragmentation of habitat. And when you have fragmentation of habitat, you've got much smaller pieces of, of land available to the, to the jaguar in this case. Um, and it also, so it cuts off the population eventually over time um, in some part, in, in some cases. And also with deforestation, it leads to uh, easier access into the forest. People can get in there further and deeper. Um, you know, here we are with COVID-19. Contact with wildlife and human beings um, is a risk of disease spreading, um, but it's also a greater risk for the biodiversity than the, <laughs> they're, my, they're my concerns really. Um, you know, in terms of poaching and hunting activities. Yeah, because when I'm looking at this picture, which just shows this cloud forest, it looks like it must be teeming with amazing wildlife. It's just incredible. Like, and what is a cloud forest, by the way? <laughs> well, a cloud forest got its name for the clouds. Uh, it's, yeah. it's definitely, <laughs> it's very shrouded in clouds and mist at all times. Um, 
And that has created a very unique habitat where there's a lot of co-evolution of flora and fauna. So plants and animals have co-evolved to live in this very, very unique and rare habitat. Um, and it's becoming rarer. And within cloud forest, you also have a, a montane cloud forest, which is even more rare than a, your lower elevation cloud forest. So, um, yeah, we, we work in the tropical montane cloud forest as well as lower level cloud forests. So there's a, you know, they're really fascinating. Um, they're definitely threatened by climate change and uh, fluctuation in temperatures, rising temperatures are really impacting the, the cloud cover. And as a result, that, that harms uh, the endemic species that live there. Got it. Um, well, that sounds rough. <laughs> Something crazy to take on. All right, but there's other issues. So here is a picture I don't like whatsoever. Um, it looks doesn't look good. This looks like somebody somewhere with a dead jaguar. This unfortunately is a dead jaguar that, um, well, this was in the news in Panama. This happened a couple of years ago now. Um, but it, it is unfortunate that the largest, the largest town, or maybe I would consider it a small city, to our study area is a very busy place and often those people enter the forest for hunting excursions and activities and i mean i don't really know the story as to how this man you know attained the the jaguar but um you know this is what's happening again along with deforestation there's just uh, an increase in illegal activities including poaching and illegal hunting for various so reasons. Got, okay, yikes. We've got deforestation, illegal poaching. Um, what about climate change? When I was Googling you, um, I read something about your comments on climate change and its effect on jaguars. Right, so directly, it's what I just previously mentioned, um, yeah. how rising temperatures are affecting the, the cloud cover which has a trickle down effect on on biodiversity so you know potentially we could have massive loss of species that, that are specialized to the cloud forest habitats and so um, our jaguars the ones that we study are in this type of a habitat so you know any change to that forest is going to affect the jaguar as an apex predator so yeah, as we know everything is all connected um, so indirectly, uh, there's another issue which was part of my, my dissertation research um, that has to do with sea level rise and there's an indigenous, uh, indigenous community that lives out in, in the islands offshore. And because of sea level rise, they're going to have to come back to move into the forest, which they have been preserving for many, many, many years. So that's another, another threat to the cloud forest and about climate change. Yeah, I imagine that would be the same thing if in the Bay Area, the sea level rose and everyone from Alameda had to move up into the hills more and more into mountain yeah. lion territory. Um, that Absolutely. is, that is um, okay, so I want to, okay, one more question. What about mm -hmm. this new challenge of, of this pandemic? Like that must be hugely affecting just your ability to do the work. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it has a lot of implications. So obviously we are trapped in Oakland and we personally can't go to our, our study area. Uh, we've become incredibly reliant on our assistants. They've really stepped it up. Um, they're taking care of it for us. They are, you know, they're managing all the materials and doing all the, the camera trap work for us. And yeah, they're, they're really invaluable. So, um, but we've heard a lot of stories about the situation in Panama from, from them and the people that we work with. So, 
you know, as with everywhere, people are losing their work and um, they want to leave the city because that's where a lot of the, the virus is being um, diagnosed in Panama. And they're going back into the valley where we work, back into this, we work in Mamuni Valley. That's, that's this uh, particular area. So people are moving back in there. So there's an increase in, in humans in the valley. Um, you know, they, they're not working. They, they probably don't have a lot of money. I've heard there's a lot of hunger actually happening. Um, so all these things have repercussions for the forest and, you know, the potential for illegal activities to happen. All right. So we are, um, I feel a little overwhelmed by that. I don't know how you looked at all that and said, I'm going to do something about that. Maybe um, you had a drink to go with that. Yeah. So now's the time where I am going to do two things. I'm going to put out a trivia question. Um, and the trivia question is, because we're going to talk about it, what is a Black Panther? And while you guys are thinking about that, you can type in or think in your head what you think a Black Panther is. Um, we're going to talk about Baja Red Sangria and take this little break. Um, um, Baja Taqueria is a delicious, lovely um, taqueria with fresh yummy food on Pima Avenue, and they make these incredible drinks. Really want to thank Jeff McGallion for stepping up, being our bartender, and um, we're going to hide you, Kim, and hopefully you'll get your glass of sangria. We're going to take a little break here and um, have a drink. I've chosen to do for the cocktail this week a red wine sangria that's very, very popular at my restaurant. Uh, the reason I chose the sangria is it's an exotic drink, um, much like the jaguars, much like the big cats. Um, it's tropical, it's flavorful, it's yummy, it's exotic, like I said. It also packs a punch and can sneak up on you like a jaguar can. So be careful with the cats and drink responsibly with the sangria. Ingredients that make up a sangria are a red wine, not a, not a dry one, more of a sweeter one, like a Merlot, which is what I'm using here today. Um, you can also use Spanish table wines, um, Italian table wines too. Um, fresh lime juice, brandy, a simple syrup, fresh OJ, cinnamon stick, and then diced up lemon and orange, fresh, and also the same dice apples, green and red apples. So to make this drink, what we do is we will take uh, the chopped up orange and lemon, and we're gonna muddle these together to bring out their juices out of their skins and out of the rind. And then, so we'll muddle this up a little bit just to bring up these flavors. Next thing we'll do is we're gonna add lime juice, orange juice, and the amounts will be on the website. Hello. Uh, simple syrup. I use a two to one, two parts water to one part sugar. And then for that little kick, brandy. And then our wine. Put the old cinnamon stick in here. We're gonna give this a good old mix. Get these flavors melded together. Sangria is traditionally from Spain, but it goes throughout many Latin cultures. Um, and so I believe it is an appropriate drink for what we're doing here today in Central America. Uh, and now we add the apples. Uh, 
And there you have it. Um, what you may want to do at this point is go ahead and chill this in the refrigerator. Um, and give it, give it 30 minutes for the flavors to blend. That's a really good idea. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, cheat a little bit and grab a glass with some ice in it. You can also drink sangria at room temperature because it is a, a red wine and it goes well actually in, in, in those temperatures. Um, pour some of this and I'm going to get some of the fruit, which over in the time you give it to lag, half an hour, those fruits really get infused in the, uh, in the flavors of the wine and the juices. And there you have it. Red wine sangria. That's really good. Thanks for watching. Best of luck to you out there in this COVID world. Stay safe, stay healthy. Check out Kamenando. Check out the Oakland Zoo. Check out Baja Sacramento Piedmont. All right, until we meet again, many blessings. Dr. Kim? Cheers. Cheers. Um, I made a post to taking action for wildlife to cam a big hug. Let's do this together. Now, chug a lug. Oh. <laughs> okay, more. Mm. Okay, that's pretty good. I put fresh mint in mine. I'm just going to take another drink. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Woo! Okay. Um, we're now going to talk about Kami Nando. And I am going to share this cool map that shows where you are, where you work. Um, okay. So begin to tell us about Kami Nando. How do you even begin to solve the problem? Like, where are we here? And why did you pick there? <laughs> well... My partner, Milton, and I have always wanted to buy land in another country. And so for conservation purposes, I should say. And so after meeting, um, meeting somebody by chance, they were working in Panama. They were working in a place called Mamoni Valley. Um, I was curious, I told Milton. So we took off to Panama and we started to search for land, you know, uh, we we actually first started in Darien, which is a different area of Panama, and then we ended up going to Mamoni Valley, and that's what you see in the orange circle there in the map. Um, that's actually the narrowest part of the entire country of Panama. It's only about 50 kilometers from coast to coast there, and um, the name Caminando in Spanish means walking. However, as mm -hmm. you can see, we spelled it okay simply because my name is Kim. And uh, we did oh, so I'm much like walking. <laughs> and we still do so much walking. That's what we do. So Caminando it was. And it. Uh, like I said, we bought land in the valley. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. So it seems like a lot of your work is done through camera traps. And that right. seems, that way of studying seems really hard. Like to be deep in that jungle, sweaty, hot, cold. I know some Oakland Zoo people went to the project <laughs> and they came back saying, wow, that was tough. Yeah. This is a very difficult environment to work in. It's definitely not for everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. It's, um, it takes a lot out of you. Uh, and that's also why you don't see a lot of jaguar studies in cloud forests. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few, but compared to lowlands forest studies, they're very limited. Um, and that's why it's, it's extremely challenging. It's, you're always wet. You're always slipping and sliding and, you know, um, it's just, it, it's fun. We love it. 
It's a love hate relationship, I think. <laughs> so I think here's something you saw in your camera trap. It must be so exciting to see a jaguar. Yes, that and is it. Yeah, the ultimate. That's what you're there for. Um, and I see that you've also see these in your camera trap. That looks like a mountain lion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed. Wow. All right. And I don't know if this is just like the ultimate. But there you go. That's a black panther. Yes. So to speak. <laughs> yeah. So people seem to be guessing. I think people are guessing pretty correctly. Um, Sam uh -huh. and oh, a lot of you seem to kind of know what it is. But what is a black panther? Well, black panther is a very generic term. It's a catch-all term that people use when they see a black cat. Um, and in this case, uh, two of the big cats are considered the black panthers, and that's the leopard or the jaguar. Um, 13 of the 38 cat species can actually be melanistic, though. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I know leopards can be black. Yes, leopards can leopards be black, and that's black. the only Okay. Um, well, that looks like yeah. a beautiful creature. That must have been very exciting. And what is it that you're learning from this study? So your PhD is in multi-scale optimization. What does that mean? And what is it that you're, what is your growing, what is happening? Like, what are you learning? What are you getting on paper from this? Well, well many things. So this project spawned out of my dissertation research and it's just continuing on and taking on its own life form. Uh, so originally, I was really interested in habitat use. So habitat use of the jaguar and connectivity of habitat for the jaguar and also for the puma. Uh, and, you know, since camera traps take photos of, of anything that walks by, you know, clearly we're interested in all the, the felid guild and their prey species as well for our long-term research. But um, multi-scale, you said multi-scale optimization. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, it's a framework for identifying the most important environmental variables mm -hmm. and the associated scales that uh, determine an organism's use of the landscape, if that makes sense. Okay, and so when you determine the use, you've got that information, who do you tell that makes a difference ultimately for the Jaguar? Does it affect policy? Does it affect building permits? Right, so yes, ultimately the goal is to have our data included in the management plan for jaguars in Panama. Got it. Um, yeah, there's very, there's still very limited information about the species in the country. Um, so the work that we do is really uh, new and unique um, and much needed. We're basically just filling the gap of a lack of information. Got it. So people have been studying it a lot in other countries, but in this particular area, in this cloud forest high up in the sky, people barely know anything and you're figuring that out. That's pretty awesome. And yes. So you're getting the information, you're getting the content, you're understanding the path of the Jaguar, but I know that you're also really trying to connect with those communities that live with mm -hmm. the Jaguar. So, what are you doing with these people to really make that connection? And I know that you were about to make a massive connection right before COVID hit and travel ended. That's true. So um, part of our program, so you can't really have research unto itself. Yeah. The community and the people, they're essential to the success of your program, absolutely, 100%. So they have to be on board with what you're doing and they have to, um, you know, you have to have a good rapport with everybody in the community. And so 
Um, that's part of what we do. Um, we have community outreach and education, and we also work with local people in the community. As I mentioned before, uh, we hire people to, to work with us in the field. We train them on all the methods. We train them on how to be a biologist and how to do the field work needed to gather the vital data that we are collecting. Um, and so this is a picture of two of our most incredible guides on either side of Milton in the center there. And he's just talking about uh, the GPS and, you know, we train them how to use the equipment and yeah, they've, they've learned quite a bit. Wow. All right. So you're making that connection. And then one thing that struck me that you've said before is most people either feel feel like anger towards the jaguar, like they want to do something kind of intense or violent, or fear. Um, such a lack of understanding, and even on the kid level. So you decided to kind of tackle that issue. And I love this photo. What is happening here? Yeah. So this photo was taken last year. Um, when we decided in collaboration with the Oakland Zoo to really build upon our educational program, which we're calling the Guardians of the Jaguar. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Mamani Valley where we work, there's four schools. There's four communities and four schools. And each school has one teacher and a handful of children. There's really not a lot. So, you know, in the past, we've been reaching out to the communities and the schools, bringing programs and materials and telling them a bit about the work that we do. And so to build upon that, we worked with the Oakland Zoo and the donors who so gratefully provided amazing materials for two of your staff to bring down to our project. And we spent some time with them delivering these bags of goods to the schools and the teachers and the children. And uh, this one particular place, um, you know, they were thrilled. They were all thrilled to have us there. And it was a very ex exciting moment. That's so good to hear. So you are studying the Jaguar. You're working with the community to build connections, trying to eliminate fear and build a pride of the Jaguar. If you're a guardian of the Jaguar, I imagine you feel so proud. Um, connect to the school. I love it. Um, here's here's an opportunity, I think, before we go on, I want to have a couple more questions, but I want to have anyone else ask a question about Kaminando's solutions or what you've learned so far. So I'm just going to look to see any questions that come up. Pop them in the public chat, and I'm going to grab it. If you've got a question, how is Kim funded? Well, that's a great question from Dell. I'm going to show this. There's Dell. How's Kim funded? <laughs> Hi, Dell. Um, well, that's a good question. As we are a very small nonprofit, it's uh, it's always a challenge. It's almost as hard as walking in the, the cloud forest. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we do apply for grants, but they're extremely competitive. And so we really have more success with uh, private donors, again, the Oakland Zoo, and uh, some foundations. So uh, we're always seeking donations from private citizens or organizations that are willing to help. Got it. Um, yeah, it must be hard. I know when you are the researcher and you're small, it's not like you have time to also be the development person right. um, and going out there. You just got to hope someone listens to something like this and just catches on. All right. We have a question here from Linda. How many Jaguars mm -hmm. are in Panama? You know? Well, that's a good question also. Hi, Linda. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say there's not a, there's not a specific number, but there has been a study done from somebody in another country who used data throughout the Jaguar range to determine some numbers through modeling. Mm -hmm. And so 
there's a guesstimate of roughly 800, 850 to 1,000 in Panama. But again, that was done through modeling and um, we don't really know exactly how accurate that is. Okay, looks like you gotta keep on working, Dr. Kim. Um, we're going to ask more questions at the end, but um, here's a question. Can you just, while we have our drinks, I hope I'm not the only one with a drink here. Um, can you just tell us a story that makes you feel like you're on the right track? You're in the right place and doing the right thing. We want to hear a story. <laughs> story time. Okay. Um, I have a few stories. I will probably stick on the community track here. And it actually goes back to the photo you just showed with the Oakland Zoo staff and the school kids there. So, um, you know, we really feel like we've made progress with the people in the community. We've built a lot of great relationships. Um, we get a lot of good feedback from people and in particular, the teachers from the four schools. They are incredibly appreciative of the material and the information that we provide to their kids and to themselves because, uh, you know, these teachers are actually trained in the city. And so they don't, they don't really have the relevant material for the, the people living in Mamoni Valley because, you know, they're just sent out to these rural areas and they don't even have internet in Mamoni Valley. And so, um, you know, one of the four teachers, I have to say, she was not a believer in the value of the forest. She was not a believer in the value of the jaguar as an apex predator. Um, she just didn't, she didn't see that those were important messages to teach the kids or relevant to anything in particular. Um, but I have to say, once we brought the Oakland Zoo down with that giant bag of goods and gave them a presentation and, uh, this teacher, she had a complete change of heart. I mean, she, for the first time, she had a big smile on her face and she felt like, okay, I think we understand the, your mission, what you're trying to do here and how important it is because uh, it's been lacking. It's just not on, on their, it's not on their radar as something valuable to teach the kids who actually live there on the edge of this incredible forest. Mm -hmm. So, um, Again, teachers have been incredibly grateful for what we've done and what we've provided. Um, and they're asking us for more all the time and they want us, they want to know when we're going to return, when are we going to give another presentation or, you know, something else. So that makes me feel like it's worth it. Absolutely. I'm sure it takes a lot to make inroads to like go to a new place and show that you're trustworthy and your heart's in the right place. Like you, that can't happen just once. Like you have had to have that presence quite a few times and get the support from the outside. So I really um, commend your work there, Kim. That's it's huge. That is such a success story. We love to hear that. And I know you can't do that without support. So we hope to get you some support. Maybe this community can support you. Um, okay, we have time for we don't have time. We have time for a quick story. <laughs> one quick more story. story. Yeah. Okay. One other cool story for you uh, about us being in the right place it has to do with community outreach and education and information. Mm -hmm. So we were given last year uh, something that just really surprised us and, and, and thrilled us at the same time. But um, we were given a video. And we watched this video and it happened to be from the same community that this photo is taken in a, it's called La Saina. And so last year, one of the people in the community saw a female tapir walking down the river with a calf. Well, somebody decided to capture that tapir and they were planning on having that for uh, a meal. And the community saw this um, and really didn't agree. And uh, they put pressure on this person who captured the tape here to release it. 
And so there's a video of it being released. And uh, I have to say that's due to our presence in the valley. And it is due to the people we've helped, um, you know, financially and the assistance that we have who speak for us. They're like spokesmen for us now. And uh, they like what we're doing. We, they like that we provide this income for them. You know, we help their families uh, live a better life. And it takes some of the pressure off of them and they can really see the value of nature the way, you know, through our lens more. And so it really put pressure on this guy to release the tape here. Wow. And that was That's what you a need. deal. I love it. Yes. Well, I want to wrap up some of the parts about coming on no by showing this gorgeous moving video. <laughs> Kim, and what are some ways we can help? So you have one minute to tell me your visions. Okay. Well, um, first of all, if you like that video, you can go to our website and watch more. Um, okay. So Adrian is going to pop in the Kaminando website there in the chat. Thanks, AB. So we. Um, So what are our needs? Is that what you asked me? <laughs> well, what is your vision for the, what's your next thing you really want to do? Okay. So uh, we've really been, prior to the COVID outbreak, we were really working on expanding our community outreach and education programs through the Valley. And also we were in the process of developing a collaboration with the indigenous Gunayala mm -hmm. people. Um, and we've been working in a portion of their land, but we're really hoping to expand our project to include all of their territory. Um, we want to set camera traps to do a whole inventory and assessment of the biodiversity and the jaguar population. They, they have, you know, one of the most extensive, pristine pieces of land in the country. So, so, um, so those are some of the things that we've been planning on uh, among many other things. And so, uh, sorry, go ahead. I said that's huge. I mean, it shows so much respect for them. 
Um, and also you're just gonna learn so much. You, I mean, to collaborate with the indigenous population is is an amazing yes. strategy and it probably took so long to make those inroads. I know you have other visions, but while we have time, um, I wanna hear what are some of your needs? Like you're a new nonprofit, I know you need funds and it seems like little bits of funds could go a long way. Um, but you also might have needs just as um, a brand a brand new organization. And I know we made a little slide about that. Um, so I'm going to pop that up. Um, what, tell us about some of the opportunities to help Kami Nando. Uh, okay. So, you know, I can't read that very well. I hope other people can see the slide. But I know. Uh, it is pretty small. It's pretty small. You know, I'm going to... I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. That's a little bit better. Um, so really, you know, this is our wish list and any donation can be specified to a certain category. Uh, again, it includes um, educational materials to bring to the schools. It includes research materials. Um, also, we would be happy to have help with the wages for our assistants, um, you know, maybe even sponsoring one of the school programs. But in addition to that, we have the volunteer work. Um, any help with social media is always welcome. Anything with grant writing or website uh, expertise. These are all things that, um, you know, a growing organization always needs help with. And uh, we're even looking for board members. So anything would, would be great. Okay, I love it. We did have a question from someone about how to volunteer. So they can go to your website, they can get your email, figure out ways they can plug in, maybe volunteer out in the field, um, maybe make one of these lovely donations, or even take a really substantial role with Kami Nando. Um, mm -hmm. Very cool. We have, I'm going to take one more question. We, I see some good ones. Um, here's one from Stephanie. What changes have you seen since you started the project? You've kind of covered some of that, but tell us one more. Yeah. Um, well, so again, if you came late, I mean, there's been some changes in, in attitudes in some of the people living in the community. Uh, you know, we've built a lot of trust with people. There's a lot more um, camaraderie around this effort and the project uh word has been spreading you know we we now have intergenerational assistance like a father and son team so you know these are really amazing changes and uh in terms of biodiversity changes those are things that we're still assessing you know we're doing a long-term monitoring study so uh, as the name implies it's going to take a long time to see any real changes in populations there all right. Well, Dr. Cam, another toast to you. Um, you got in there, you and your partner, Milton, created Kami Nando and made it happen. And while you're affecting Jaguars and people, you're affecting us too. We're inspired and we feel like there's hope. In a time where we need some hope, you're providing it. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope we can kind of dig in and help you somewhere. I hope you hear from some people. Um, Adrian has popped in um, to the comments ways you can donate or contact Kaminando and also information about our next our next cocktails and conservation, which is actually tomorrow night. We're going to be welcoming Karen Vardaman. She's known as the Wolf Lady, and she helps to save the gray wolves that are returning to California. So it's same time, same place tomorrow, and then we'll have some um, some of the um, Wednesdays coming up the rest of the month. This was our premiere, so we want to thank you for being part of that experiment, and thank you all for joining us. Um, cheers. Thank you, Amy. Cheers. All right. Um, great to spend the time, and everyone be safe and have a great evening.